the first guests to uh, speak here today is uh, Sandy Hilal and uh, Alessandro Petti. Uh, they are uh, from uh, the practice called DAR, Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency, in Beit Sahur in Palestine. Uh, as I understood yesterday, they're actually staying in Stockholm for the moment, or since a year or so. Uh, DAR is a combination of an architectural studio and a residency program. DAR aims to use spatial practice as a form of political intervention. DAR's program uh, has gathered together architects, artists, activists, urbanists, filmmakers and curators to work collectively on the subjects of, politics, of politics of architecture. Since their first work, Stateless Nation, at the Venice Biennale in 2003, and throughout their more recent architectural interventions in refugee camps, the, artist, the artistic practice of Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petti has explored and acted within and against the condition of permanent temporariness that permeates uh, temporary, contemporary forms of life. And that is actually part of the book they are releasing now, and it's possible for you to uh, buy in the uh, coffee breaks and so. Uh, so please welcome Sandy Hilal e Alessandro Patti. I would say it. Yes, maybe I use this one. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this invitation. And um, I'm not sure if I have to stand or sit down. Um, and thank you for being here uh, this morning. So maybe I uh, would like to start with two quotes that usually, actually I never start a lecture, but I thought that these two quotes somehow set a little bit the tone and set also uh, our positions regarding the theme of architecture and politics. The first quote is from Giancarlo De Carlo, and uh, it goes something like this. Architecture is too important to leave it to the architects. The second quote is from Carl Schmitt, that says that um, there is no uh, politics without spatial manifestations, and also there is no space without political ideologies. So these two quotes, in a way, set two very important points. First, that every architecture is embedded into politics. Um, it's then just a question how much you want to work on it, and how much you want to acknowledge, and how much you uh, mobilize that politics towards uh, justice, equality, or other kind of values that you believe in. And the first one, the one of Giancarlo De Carlo, is very important to remind, since we are in a school of architecture, that what is important is not the discipline in itself. It's actually how the discipline is lived by the society and what is the relation of architecture with society. Uh, with this doesn't mean that you have to forget that you are an architect, but always that you are an architect at the service of society. You are not an architect serving a discipline. Um, and the idea for today, it was also to maybe use uh, just very recently book that Sandy and I published um, as a sort of outline to exactly navigate the specific relation between architecture and uh, um, politics. More specifically, um, we are interested in um, political concepts. We are interested in the ways in which political concepts are actually mobilized in order to activate uh, different architectural projects. And in fact, this book starts with no index, with no introductions. You are forced to read these definitions that you see, where uh, we try to uh, define these political concepts starting from uh, the projects. So it's not a theorization for the sake of theorization, but it's a theorization that emerged from the practice, emerged 
from the specificity of the conditions that we were trying to understand through, uh, through architecture. So today, what we uh, maybe would like to do um, is to pick up some of these uh, definition concepts as a con sort of methodological tool, and then to describe, if we have enough time, uh, two, three, or maybe four different projects. Maybe also we can very briefly point it out to them, and then maybe, if you are interested, you can also um, look closer to them uh, in, uh, in the publication itself. So, I mean, I, I would like um, a bit even before navigating in these uh, concepts to sort of explain from where we departure and which is the condition through which we uh, also think our architectural projects. Because the moment that you are working on the ground, you sort of have your own, uh, let's say, ideologies in that sense, concepts that uh, uh, guide you, but also condition through which we have awareness that we are working from, which is the condition of permanent temporariness. So I, I would spend these two minutes explain what is permanent temporariness for us. And in that sense, it's very much inspired by working in refugee camps where you know, in, in refugee camps like the one of the Palestinian uh, re refugee camps, they are 70 years old, yet people speak about them as they would vanish the day after. So, and, and, and refugees themselves are speaking about the camp as they are vanished the day after, yet they exist and they become a permanent temporary spaces. Yet it would be a mistake to think that this is only about refugees. And this is where actually all the book departure because because in a sense, how many of us is living in cities where we think that maybe we will be leaving a, a year after? And we would not invest enough in the city with this idea that we are temporary in the city. And we might spend all our life being temporary, all our life, not really investing in the place where we are living exactly because we feel that we are temporary. And I guess that in this room, if not 80% of you is dealing with Lond as their temporary city, yet you might end up by living here. And you will postpone your life for 10 years, 15 years, until you are maybe convinced or you are not even convinced that you should ever be permanent. And in that sense, you know, being architects, certainly we, within the discipline, we are taught that what we do is the permanence, you know? We, we believe in that since you know, once we do a temple, the temple will last forever, much more than us. When we do a school, we are aiming that this would last forever. And in that sense, we are learned and taught and, 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 and be prepared to think only about permanency. Yet the question here with what is happening in the world, is it ever possible to think also about temporariness as a condition of, of life and not to tight rights only to permanency because it feels also looking at the whole crisis of migrations and refugees around as their problem would be solved once they become citizens with the passports, but their problem begins there actually. It's not that the problem is that they would deal with what house mean, where the home is, what does it mean to be in two places in the same time, all these issues of, of, of temporariness becomes very strongly, and it is very present in society, yet we insist that rights are tied to permanency. So people will wait their rights to become with this idea of, you know, I will arrive there, as if I am in a race, and once I would become a Swedish citizen, Italian citizen, it's done. No, I, I am there in this port of permanency, and, and then you would discover that this makes absolute no sense. So all the book, the projects of architecture, the concepts we are doing is trying to navigate this condition of permanent temporariness. We are not saying that one is better than the other. We are not saying that it should we should go there or we should go there, here. We are not proposing that temporariness is the solution at all. But what we are proposing is that we should be aware as architects that we are not living 
living anymore in this era of permanency. It's not, we are not there. We, it, things are changing and we need actually to update ourselves and the discipline in order for us to be able to operate within this condition of permanent temporariness. Good. So the first concept that maybe um, we like to uh, talk about is the notion of the camp, and specifically of a refugee camp. Um, if I say, what is a refugee camp? Most likely, the first image that uh, comes up to in your mind is something similar to the one that you see on the screen, on the left side, which is an accompaniment of very fragile structures. Uh, something that, in fact, is not uh, destined to last, something that needs to be dismantled um, quickly. However, the image that you see on the left is an image of the Hesha refugee camp in Bethlehem in 1952, and the image that you see on the right is the Hesha refugee camp today. So there is an incredible gap between the image that we have in our mind because of the media uh, and the actual reality of many refugee camps. Um, and strangely enough, in fact, um, for architects, by simply visiting some of the camps, you realize that you are confronted with um, an extremely specific uh, spatial conditions. And we as architects also don't have a right vocabulary of trying to describe and to make sense and even to intervene in these specific spaces. And let me say from the beginning, um, when we talk about camps, um, we don't, uh, I mean, first of all, the relation with politics is very clear. Camp are the special manifestation of a political failure. When politics failed, camps are established. If politics actually works, camps should not exist in the first place. So I can be very idealistic. If I would have been maybe a philosopher, I can make a lecture about camps. But we are damned to be an architect. And architects cannot just engage with analysis of the reality. They have to uh, work upon it. We are called for transformations. Otherwise, we always uh, somehow feel that we don't uh, do what we are asked to do. And therefore, despite, you know, I think we are posing ourselves into this very horrifying situations which we created in the modern era. And by the way, the history of the camp will be interesting to un unpack because it has to do with modernism. It's the dark side of modernism. You know, meanwhile, we're building these beautiful uh, buildings, you know, modern for the new populations. At the same time, there was an idea of building the camps where people be deprived completely by their political rights. Uh, but that is in, in another issue altogether. Maybe we'll talk about this uh, in another time. What I would like to concentrate uh, today is, first of all, trying to set up the scene of, um, of our practice when we started to think about how it's possible to even, first of all, understand what is a camp today, and secondly, how even to think how to intervene, and what is the stake when you decide to intervene. What is the stake when you intervene in the camp? And for the people in the camp, architecture is the worst enemy. Why? Because architecture has to do with permanency. People in the camps, they don't want to live in the camp. So every single act in the camp is a political act. Every architecture in the camp is a political statement. So since 1950s in the Haitian, there were very painful discussions where people start to understand that the tent were not enough solid you know, to protect them, for example, from the weather. But you know, they wanted to go back to their houses. They, by the way, they were just a few kilometers from uh, the camp itself. So these were fundamental architectural questions. Do we have to build a wall? But if we build a wall around us, does it mean that we are going to stay? What are the implications of building a wall? And the time passed on. And then the problem was the roof. Do we have to build a roof? But if we build a roof, that's it. We are going to stay. So entering this debate for us was entering in the ways in which we understand architecturally, politically. It's not just an issue of design, I like this shape or the other shape, but it has to do of the implication 
of all these decisions of opening a window, um, building a roof, building a wall, uh, all of this are strictly linked with rights, strictly linked to the right to stay, to the right to live in dignity, to the right to return. Because every um, act in that sense could also undermine the right of return. So architecture should not exist in the first place in the camp. Because if you believe in the right of return, as it's inscribed in international humanitarian laws and international law, is uh, they should be allowed to go back. But that situation has perpetuated itself for now more than seven decades. And unfortunately, that is the destiny of most of the camps that we are building in these very days. Because in some way, as I said, idealistically, I would like to think that camps should not exist in the first place. But we are in a situation in which there is a proliferation of camps and a proliferation of camp-like conditions to the point that I think partially there is a spillover of that condition into other kind of uh, non-camp situations, but somehow they share the same um, structure in terms of um, fragility and precarity of, of our own existence. So these two pictures that you see there is, uh, there is a gap, right, between how we understand what is a camp and what actually is the camp. And that is the first thing that also moves us to, to try to understand and try to make definition of this concept and try to refine them. And that is actually very much how we started the book, trying to share this vocabulary with the reader to say we need to work on a specific vocabulary that allowed us to conceptual and political vocabulary that allowed us to try to imagine what kind of interventions are possible in the camp. Um, I will briefly, because we don't have enough time, I will briefly start to talk about one of the project that is called the Refugee Heritage, because it has to do very much with these very painful questions that we asked in the Hesha at some point, and we simply ask, uh, do refugee camps actually have a history? If a place is 70 years old, can you say that actually there are historical sites? Even for uh, a building being uh, older than 50 years, by law in Palestine should be under protection. So there are some shelters, for example, that UN built that in theory should be protected. But of course, already these questions, it was such a, a let's say, political questions, asking you know, how much history and how that history actually can be recognized. So the way how we um, approach these questions, um, by using arts, mobilizing arts, to actually have a political discussion that was impossible to have if it was not framed as an art project. And the way how we did it, it was that, what if we uh, produce the evidence for describing the Hesho refugee camp as a World Heritage Site. As you might know, there are certain criteria to describe a site under UNESCO uh, protection. should have certain uh, specific characteristics. Um, so what we did, we take the Annex 5 of these UNESCO applications, and we seriously ask ourselves and follow these applications, and we try to make sense of the Haitia as a, as a structure. Um, and here, the, uh, first of all, the first operation that we had to do, it was to document how we move from a tent to a shelter, to a, a one floor house, two floor house. So it was an important way to actually document the evolution, because all of that history, by the way, is a history that has always been negated by UN organization, by NGOs, and by the way, by the community itself. Because refugees, of course, they don't want to recognize that history, because that history is a history of shame, is a history of uh, pain. So, in a way, for us, documenting that history was the opposite. We ask ourselves, is it possible to document that history without undermining the right of return? Is it possible to have a life in the present, in dignity, without giving up your right of return. Because for so many years, architecture has been postponed because the idea that one day there would be the salvations. One day you go back home and everything will be fine. 
But that's not true, and that is unfortunately the painful experience of many people that live displaced and in exile. You know that there is no return, even if there is a, a right to it, but the return will be always um, a, a possibility of returning to a site which is um, much more complex and complicated between the relation between the site where you, where you live in and the site where you possibly can return. Here, I just have to skip very quickly um, the way how we um, describe uh, and justify the description of the Haitian refugee camp uh, by using the uh, two criteria that for us was important, the immaterial dimensions of the Haitian, but also the material dimensions, also how the house that were built, um, making associations with different other sites uh, all over the world. But as I said, at some point, this discussion were also uh, tied into a specific uh, will for, for, uh, by the community to try to give an image, to try to have actually a space to inhabit that in a way is the materialization of the permanent temporariness. Uh, at that time, we were uh, at the beginning of establishing of an uh, um, uh, educational program that's called Campus in Camps. And we needed a, a space for gathering. We needed a space in which you know, um, uh, can be used for this educational program, but also it's part of Alphenic Center, which is in Dehesha. And we needed also a space for people to um, have their weddings, they have their kind of social um, gathering in the camp, uh, conflict negotiations. So uh, the idea that emerged after all this discussion was actually to to build a, a tent made of concrete, instead of simply, as sometimes architecture is called for, to give uh, technical solutions to political problems, we wanted to remain to use architecture to pose questions, to pose, to materialize a question in front of the people, to, to materialize the paradox of people that live thinking that that situation is temporary, but what is happening is actually that kind of, there is a perpetuation of this temporariness. And what, what this perpetuation of temporariness does in relation to the right to stay and the relation of, of the right of return. So the construction of the permanent, the concrete tent is first of all, was a place of gathering, but also a place that somehow, uh, where this conversation could emerge, where somehow one can build alliance, political alliance, and uh, try to renovate the, uh, the, the, the fight for the right of return. Um, the image on the right is also uh, the concrete tent that we uh, realized in the Emirates. And that was a very, for us at the beginning, uh, difficult project because most of our projects were based where we were living and we, you know, we knew how uh, challenge could be when you cannot be uh, in the long term in a place where you can build an architecture and then understand how that could evolve. Um, but in this case, one thing that uh, really uh, worked well for us, it was in the moment we started to uh, have a discussions with people working in the Emirates, uh, the condition of permanent temporariness, despite being very far from the very condition of the camp, was actually very close to the fact that, as you might know, 80% of people living in the Emirates, they are uh, guests. If they lose their job, they have to leave the country. Uh, and this is happening for decades. And once again, you imagine that, for example, people, in this case, was in Abu Dhabi, were born in Abu Dhabi, and they could say, you know, I'm from Abu Dhabi, but they are not citizens in Abu Dhabi. So if they, uh, you know, lose their jobs, they have just to uh, go and no one knows where because they were actually uh, uh, they were born there. So that was also an important moment in our practice in which somehow and that also is, if you like, the political ambitions is also trying to understand how this concept that we understood by uh, uh, being in, in, in the Haitian, by being in Palestine, could be relevant uh, in other kind of situations and can actually politicize an issue. Because otherwise, the condition of labor in, uh, in the Emirates, it, just a condition, it seems like it's not a political condition. But actually, if you look at that condition from the lens of Palestinian refugees, you suddenly realize that actually they share 
similarities, and they share the same problem. The problem of you know, not having the right to stay and the, or the right to go back. So that is what is uh, negated. Okay, and actually what, what we, um, as Alessandro said, we, we built a concrete tent, but also we uh, designed a school in Shafat refugee camps, we designed a square in Fawar refugee camp. But as we are worried, I mean, and, and then we show maybe at the end uh, uh, these projects in refugee uh, camps in Palestine, but we would like to take you um, to Sweden now, and in that sense to also uh, show how the condition of permanent temporariness is also relevant in place like Sweden, because hearing us so far, uh, somebody would think we are still in the Middle East, we are still in the camp. Yeah, we are in Abu Dhabi still economically, I can understand that it is uh, sort of in, in a, in a well-shaped economically, yet it is still space that uh, deals with precarity and uh, you know, when we came to Sweden, the major challenge was, can we ever bring our practice here? And, and of course, we were not um, sure about it, but certainly we felt uh, the need to come to Europe because, in a sense, with the whole thing of the crisis of refugees and migrants, we feel that we don't here speak about numbers at all, no? I mean, uh, we were yesterday laughing in the taxi is that, you know, when we speak about numbers in Germany, in Sweden, and then you compare them to Lebanon or Turkey that, or, or Jordan, that they doubled actually of numbers and still it's not the crisis that we are pointing at. But we, I mean, we, we feel that there is something very strong there and that our practice can really be able to interact with places in Europe. So we arrived to Sweden and uh, we brought the practice here and, and uh, I mean, I, I personally was commissioned by uh, the Staten Construct Public Art Agency to do a project in Boden, north of Sweden. And, uh, you know, arriving to Boden, certainly, and of course, we immediately became guests, right, in, in Sweden. So we had to deal with ourselves as newcomers privileged newcomers, yet newcomers. We are not sure how many years we are going to be living here. So certainly we uh, feel that we are in a very temporary condition, but I myself lived in Italy for 13 years and still, and, and you know, I'm made by BHD in Italian. I speak Italian perfectly, yet, I mean, I tick all the boxes for the race of citizenship, right? I tick the books of uh, being an, an, an intellectual, Italian, uh, having kids that are half Italians, myself have Italian citizenship, yet I was not recognized by Italians at, as Italian, right? Yeah, and I thought I would not come again to Sweden and run the same race, because if I did it once and I did not manage to actually follow the, the whole path and become finally a citizen, something that all of us has almost the hallucination that we can ever be doing. So I decided I would not run this race. That's it. Yet, I recognized how difficult it is, even for educated people like us, to access the highly codified Swedish public space. I mean, this is, we speak all the time about accessibility, accessibility, the right of everybody to access. We are all equal, yet we don't, we don't realize how difficult it is for newcomers to be part of this public, and we demand that they should behave and learn perfectly and become perfect guests and behave the way they should be behaving without compromising any of these codes. And this is where the real refugee crisis stands. It doesn't stand in number. It doesn't stand in how much a refugee would cost. It stands what will happen with our public space, right? How can we share public space? Are we able to share public space? These are major, what does inclusion mean for us? What does integration mean for us? Why, I mean, wh how can we deal with all this? So. I mean, to make a long, because do we have still, ha I just to organize myself. How many minutes? Eight minutes, okay, no, I can. Um, okay. 
Yeah, I have. I, I will tell you the story. Yes, absolutely. So I, I, I arrived to uh, Buden, November, and it was the first day of snow, very nice, and everybody was super happy about it. Yet, I mean, I visited what they called the Yellow House, which is what you see in uh, that uh, space, which is one uh, of the million housing program that uh, was done in uh, Sweden. And in a sense, I entered there and, you know, we explained a bit what was our experience in uh, Palestine. And I certainly was looking for the political and social agencies I used to work with in Palestinian refugee camps. But I entered this yellow house. And I have to admit that most probably I never smelled the depression the way I smelled it in this house. I mean, people were sitting in their rooms sort of in thinking, this is not the dream I was thinking Sweden is, right? I, I made all this journey, all this risk of being here, and finally I would find myself in an isolated, white, uh, un, uh, uncodified place like Budin, and I, I, I need to deal with it, right? And some people say, I mean, some which is painful to hear. Some people would say, I am here only for my kids, right? I mean, it's like I give up with my life. It's fine for me. I, my life is over. And I am here for my kids. And it's, it's painful to hear twice. First, because they would lose their time. Second, because their kids have to deal with what does it mean to be first generation, second generation Swede. And by best, they would become new Swedes, right? So this is the best that they're in five, six generation it will come. And the question, here was very strong. And, and of course, I, I was thinking, what can we do here? I mean, there is nothing that can be done here. And, and everybody was telling me that maybe if they would arrive to Malmo, then things would change. And this is the Sweden they were longing for, right? And of course, all the question is that what can ever be done? And I remember myself calling Alessandra and say, you know, every, the context is everything. Here there is nothing that can be done. Everybody is telling me that all what they are uh, willing to do is to escape the place. So how can you even live with a community that wants to escape the place? So this extreme condition of Buden, and I was actually accompanied by the Swedish government, by the public art agency as, as a, and the artist, Strange, in, I mean, very strange scene. The Palestinian artist, architect arriving to Buden with the government. So it's by all was a very messy sort of things. And yet we, uh, and, and while speaking with an Iraqi guy in the Yellow House, I desperately, I say, oh my God, everybody wants to leave Buden. He said, no, 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 you should meet with Yasmin and Brahim. And I was just like, oh my God, I have two names. And, and certainly maybe if they found something in Buden, then maybe we can find something in Buden. And, we were desperately looking for Yasmin and Brahim, finding Yasmin and Brahim, getting inside their house. And suddenly, I sort of found the agency I was looking for, right? And while Yasmin and Brahim were hosting us, and in particular hosting the Swedish government, I mean, there was this momentum where they were very nicely hosting everybody, and I was trying to translate to the Swedish government where, while we were speaking in Arabic and Arabic coffee, and, and I thought, in this tiny living room, two couples of Syrian refugees are managing to host the grandiose Swedish government, right? And in that sense, I thought, what can we do with this very strong condition of architecture of the threshold, right? I mean, what happened normally is that what, what migrants and refugees do is that when they are unable to actually access the public space. What they do is that they refuge in their private and they create their own publics. The problem with this, the real problem that, that countries like Sweden and many other countries will face is that this, if we will not recognize these, public spa these private public spaces as potential, uh, uh, two minutes, okay, as potential uh, uh, spaces of collectivity, then Segregation is, the, is where we are heading. And the question is that, is it possible to think about th this threshold as a potential new architectural space? And in that sense, you know, the, 
I have two minutes, so I will tell you where the living room is. Can we? And, and now there are six active uh, living rooms, one in the Van Abe Museum at the threshold and the entrance of the Van Abe Museum. Uh, uh, no, I better that because then I would. In the Van Abe Museum, uh, hosted by, and of course I became very interested in the figure of the host as a very important figure in society and how we activate certain spaces by having a host. So we have six uh, living room uh, active uh, right now and if you want to know more I can uh, still be, and, and you know you have the book, you have uh, many things that can, uh, but I mean before finishing with this two minutes, certainly one of the things uh, I, we were very much as in inspired by this threshold, by this square that we did in Fawar refugee camp. While, I mean, with the lack of a state, people insisted that if we need to have a plaza that we all share, this plaza needs to have walls and doors, and we should cross the threshold. And they actually were very clear that without crossing the threshold, there is no means for us to have a sort of self-organization space. So here, I mean, as architects, we should sometimes think about uh, you know, the power that walls might be bringing the moment they can actually claim agency, the moment that, uh, uh, you know, it, it can be... Um, so in, in, in that sense, certainly, maybe I, I, I would conclude this way, that the threshold becomes for us in place like Sweden, especially in place like Sweden, because there is this tendency of separating the public from the private, as if, you know, there is the public and there is the private and there is nothing that happens in the middle. And bringing all the practice of Dar and the permanent temporariness, we are realizing that there is a whole gap in architecture that needs to be looked at tested and understand as amazing potential to understand today terms like inclusion, participation, integration, public space and private space in place like uh, Sweden. And, and then to finish with, this is a school that we built for, uh, we designed for 1000 uh, girls in Shofat refugee camp. And again, you know, it, it was uh, very much, I cannot say more than this, but it was very much about what does it mean to bring the enemy in, uh, in, in the camp. And, and there was the whole debate between refugees is that do we really, should we think about today and our kids today, or sh should we think about the future that might be coming one day and, 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 and uh, you know, we wait until this messianic day becomes. And it creates a whole debate in, this, in the camp. What does it mean to have a nice designed school in a place like a refugee camp? And, and we cannot speak about all our projects, but if you are interested, the book is there, and there is so many out of it, both on how we combine private life with public life, on how our practice actually moves between public and mm -hmm. private. So it's very much about us, our kids, the practice in our house, us activating our living room for 10 years in Palestine as a major space for architecture debate uh, in terms. And then, you know, you come to Sweden, begin this project of the Madafa, and we realized how we ourselves by first place created the Madafa in our house as a studio uh, of architecture and as a way to bring discussions like decolonization, public, private, common, in a place like Palestine. But the nice thing that is happening that we are also realizing to bring this to Sweden, something that we were absolutely a year and a half ago, not sure that it's even possible. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you.